I'm Ricky. And I'm Joe, and this is Beer and Broadband, Season 5, Episode 12 of the Beer and Broadband Podcast. As I screw that all up, but we're just going to keep rolling with it. It is slated to come out on October 10th, 2022. And today we're going to be talking about brewing for the most part. But uh, we, uh, we made some meads. I made some meads, I should say. Ricky helps sometimes. Uh, so we made a uh, buckwheat boche, which we're not going to try on this. We've already tried it in the past. I think most of the people that listen to this podcast know about the saga of the buckwheat boche, but I'm talking about the stinky one, not the coffee one. So um, then I also made a candy corn mead that was based off of man-made meads recipe, which um, I, I thought was a lot of fun to make with. It basically, you just melt down candy corn and then add honey to it. Uh, which is uh, candy corn is already a honeyed candy anyway. So it has like some of those like kind of flavors and stuff like that. Then I back sweeten it. And then I made a blueberry hibiscus melomel. Now, not to get too far into this, but both the candy corn mead and the blueberry hibiscus melomel are 17% meads. I didn't intend for them to come out 17% meads, but they came out 17% meads. And they're both super clear. Uh, the blueberry mellow Mel looks like brandy or something like that. Like, uh, mm-hmm. Ricky was talking about, I'm definitely making it again. I made three gallons. I've almost drank it all. I have like two, uh, wine glass, uh, wine bottles left. And then this tasting bottle and then the candy corn mead. Um, it, I have just a gallon of it cause I didn't know if I'd like to make it again, but I thought it would be like a fun fall like kind of thing. And since this is coming out around Halloween, it's also kind of a Halloweeny candy. Mm-hmm. So, um, while I drink, you, uh, yeah, talk. So the blueberry hibiscus, very, very good. Like I said, it's got great color, great smell. It's a little sweet, but not too sweet. There's a little bit of that floral and there's not even like a strong berry flavor. It's almost like the essence of blueberries. Yeah. You know, and we've talked in the past about how it's kind of hard to get berry flavors like directly, like really forward because, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's the sugar profile. It's really good, though. Like where most like meads or most ciders that I make, I will like drink by the glass. You know, I drink them more like I drew like drink a beer. Yeah. This is very much in that like wine area. Yeah. Of, like I want like a two ounce pour of this that I'm going to sip on for like an hour. Yeah. Very, very smooth. Very nice. That's, yeah. I'm I'm not sure I'm ready to call it my favorite thing you've made, but it's definitely up there. It is in the consideration. Um, yeah. Very nice. The candy corn one for me though, it's a, it's good. Like it's brewed well. It's very smooth for its ABV, but it's just like a sweeter and thicker plain meat. Yeah. Like it's got this viscosity to it. It's almost like it's sticky. It's got a lot of sugar to it, at least in like in the flavor profile. I'm not sure I'd want like multiple bottles of just that, but I think it would make a really good base for like launching off into like some sort of fall meat or something like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I can taste because I know like what it was, what it kind of should taste like as like just the base mead by mm-hmm. itself because these were both made with wildflower mead. Um, I know what it should taste like if it was just made to be a traditional mead. Yeah. I can taste the difference, mm-hmm. but it is so subtle. And the, the candy corn, so one of the problems with this was I burned a little bit of the candy corn on the bottom and I thought that would come through the flavor and it didn't. Like you can't tell the, yeah. the, the a little bit of the candy corn got burned on the bottom of the pot. But the... The candy corn itself imparts this almost like kind of artificial flavor to it. If if you're if you know what you're looking for, yeah, it's a just like bit. a little hint in the very end, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's a it's an artificial kind of honey flavor, right? Otherwise, it doesn't really. I think I could make instead of making it with candy corn, I could take the flavors, the honey, the vanilla the things that you're supposed to have in candy corn, Mm -hmm. put them into this and then put, or put them into a mead and then would have a candy corn mead that tasted like candy corn more than. Yeah, you probably could. I'll say what I actually like the most about it is the viscosity. Yeah. The only other mead I've had that's like more viscous than this was one we had when we went out to California, but it was just so sweet. Yeah. Like it was past dessert level. 
to get all that sugar coming to make it so thick. And I don't know if maybe it's something in the candy corn, whatever thickening agent they use mm-hmm. that does this to it, but that's that's nice. That's why I'm thinking like this as a base, and then you put some other fall flavors into this, but it'll still have that viscosity that like stick to your tongue feeling. Like maybe Could some really cinnamon good. and some clove and some things like that, and then maybe like... Uh, I was thinking this that would actually be a really good base for some of the stuff you do with the pumpkin meats. Yeah. You know, you put pumpkin in there and this is this will get that closer to that like pumpkin pie flavor because it's got that like almost gooeyness you get from that pumpkin. Well, I'm thinking about making another pumpkin mead. We could get a bag of um like another two gallon thing mm-hmm. of pumpkin mead. We could get another bag of candy corn. And yeah, do the I same mean, process. In all honesty, it might be a good addition. Okay, we we can try that. I'm totally down with that. I'm I'm not. I, I was thinking of doing something similar, just like mm. from a different kind of direction. So yeah, I want to definitely make the um, pumpkin meat sweeter this time because I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to do it on the podcast. But both pumpkin beans that I've made, I've let go dry, and it kind of needs that sweetness. And I, we had some itself, and it just did not taste like pumpkin pie. Yeah. It tasted like a pumpkin beverage, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like pumpkin pie. And yeah. it's the spice is kind of not there anymore. I'm going to do a tincture and some other things and try to get that pumpkin flavor into it. And then, you know, go. so I, I'm going to go buy a pumpkin and I'm going to buy a big liter of, of um, buy, buy a thing of uh, vodka. Okay. And then I'll make a couple of tinctures of pumpkin oh, okay. with yeah, spices yeah, yeah. in it. And see if I can. I'm gonna make two, two two gallon batches. One that's just made like a traditional one that's just sweetened mm-hmm. more, and one that's made with tinctures, and see which one works out better. I got you. Yeah. So you yeah. you want to do something similar to what I did with those raspberries, and that you're gonna yeah. get those like slices of pumpkin, put get it, it really there. in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can see that. And then use that because otherwise the pumpkin will be too vegetal. But then yeah, use that can, to be able to. I know. can really see that because you know those. I know you haven't had any yet, but the the raspberries that came out were really good because it wasn't overly powerful. You had that real good like essence of raspberry to it, but it wasn't too sweet. It didn't like lower the ABV too much. So like even the you know, we we've been using it in mixed drinks and we've said, look, some of these mixed drinks we're making, they're like they're good. But like this is such like a subtle flavor that like, you know, we put some in Coke to try to make like a raspberry yeah. Coke. And the sweetness just covers it up. So we've been putting in like ginger ale, they've been great. So, yeah, I can definitely see that, you know, trying to get some concentrated level of pumpkin. One of the things, maybe I'll try this because I don't want to waste your pumpkin stuff because we've got a little bit too much of the raspberry. I was thinking, like, what does a raspberry tincture really taste like if you try and concentrate it? Like, let me take, like, a cup of my raspberry vodka, heat it up a little bit, you know, reduce it to half. How does that change the flavor? Yeah, you that, know, like, that and would I be, concentrate that raspberry and make it like a, a, like a, a super raspberry extract. Sort of, I think you would have to add something to the vodka though to get it to reduce like that. See, I don't know because like your vodka is forty percent alcohol, so like that'll just freely evaporate. So essentially, you I would end up with some sort of raspberry liquid that is no longer alcoholic, but is forty percent lower in volume. I, I understand that, but what I'm saying is I think a lot of the flavor would get stripped out, so you need something to kind of hold on to it. So, like, you would have to add, like, a, a like make it a simple syrup or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I was getting at. I don't know, like, the obviously the ethanol will evaporate, but will whatever else is imparting that raspberry flavor evaporate? I'm I, not sure what that, that I chemical think it, compound I th- is. I think there's a, there's a high possibility that it will strip some of that out okay look hey my kid's not home this weekend maybe i'll try it yeah we'll you see. should <laughs> just see what happens take maybe only like half a cup and just get it down to a fourth a cup and see what that tastes like now i'm trying to find where i made the buckwheat honey on my thing in here the the different buckwheat honeys and i know it's on here ah buckwheat boche i just want to see so that one ended up being 14 percent Mm -hmm. Uh, right at 15 percent so the reason we're not tasting that one on here is it's not a bad mead it uh, we took it to sell people liked it and everything like that but it has like a aftertaste like Mm -hmm. a funk 
and that is the same smell and taste that you got when you buck bochet it it was the same smell and taste that was there when i ate it and i've had other buckwheat honey that didn't have that so there was something about the pollens or Mm -hmm. other things that were in the unfiltered buckwheat honey that made it so pungent (laughs) yeah and you know i don't think like plant varieties are protected so that could be part of it as well. So like, there's a bunch of different type of oranges. Right. So you don't have to specify it's navel orange, you know, honey. So maybe this like different breeds of buckwheat have different flavors, and just that one wasn't working. Maybe, but I, I mean, the, the this was clearly something like I bought it off Etsy, and someone just like mm. went and like got the honey out of somewhere, and I wonder if it like. Like they have like a cow field or something. It almost has like that kind of like. Yeah. You know, I I didn't want to say that. That's kind of the same thing I was thinking. Yeah. Like, is this just a farm that has buckwheat and just maybe, you know, whatever they're fertilizing with or something like that just makes it into the overall flavor? Yeah, exactly. And so I, growing up on a farm, I know that that smell comes from animals mm. doing their stuff. It's not just like pee and poo, but there's like that's just like the hay and the the other stuff like kind of contributes to that. So if they were recycling that into some sort of fertilizer, that could have like had a serious impact on the flavor of the honey. Yeah, uh, which is kind of what it seems like. Okay. Um, so I'm probably not going to get that again. I want to revisit buckwheat honey. Um, there's a different source of honey. Yeah, just get a different source of it. And one of the other reasons we're not drinking it on this is I want to let what I've got left age for like two years. Yeah. Um, and just see kind of what happens with it. Because the, the the see, three months since we had it last, it's turned more like a cola flavor. Okay. But it still has that, like, that kind of aftertaste to it, which I don't mm-hmm. particularly enjoy. But I had a bottle... Uh, two weeks ago and it tasted like cherry coke oh really yeah yeah so i'm i'm kind of in the buck like i'm i appreciate buckwheat honey i am not looking for that same flavor profile from that particular buckwheat honey gotcha we made that coffee mail buckwheat buckwheat coffee mail thing and it was so good it was i drank i still have like two bottles of that left I drank one of them compared to the bottle of orange blossom uh, coffee mail that I had left over. And it is so much better. It, I mean, it really nails the coffee mail flavor in that sort of thing. Um, so I want to do that again. I want to make like another like two or three gallons of that. And I think I'm going to get like maybe 10 pounds of buckwheat honey and do another two gallons of um, some sort of buckwheat boche also and see if it has the same sort of thing, but I'm going to source it from the same place that I got the coffee mail buckwheat honey mm-hmm. instead of the other. So speaking of the buckwheat honey, the other reason that we included that here is that we um, uh, had pasteurized, or I pasteurized, I, I am fumbling through that topic. Mm-hmm. I pasteurized the buckwheat honey. Uh, the buckwheat boche because it wasn't the the um, the uh, honey hadn't fully been yeah it was raw honey yeah but yeah. but it it also had not gotten all of the um, it wasn't to the the, the ABV tolerance mm. of the and I didn't want it to refer oh gotcha, at some gotcha. Point. okay okay. Man, I had a hard time explaining that. Okay, I know what you mean, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you pasteurize the final brew to kill the yeast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I pasteurized it. It was a very interesting process mm-hmm. because I didn't pasteurize it in the bottles. I pasteurized it in the containers that I had brewed them in. So I had okay. three one-gallon jars, okay, one-gallon yeah, yeah. glass one jars. Gallon. Yep. I took a crock pot. You know, I put the, mm. the lids just kind of loosely on so it wouldn't build any pressure or boil yeah. or anything like that. And I let I got the water up to 156, set that down inside on a little stand, mm-hmm. and just let it sit there for like 15 minutes, took it out, and, you know, went to the next one, the next one, yeah. the next one. And then I bottled them mm. <laughs> after that, like after they cooled off. Uh, so, like, I let it sit for another week. I found that to be much easier than trying to pasteurize, like – doing a, a sealed bottle mm-hmm. or something like yeah, after yeah. I'd bottled it, 
Um, and I didn't worry so much about there being contamination or water that got down in it because mm -hmm. I was able to, uh, you know, kind of still cover it up. Yep. Um, but the steam that might fall back down in it was so little it because it wasn't that that hot. It wasn't like boiling or yeah. anything like that. So, so and this is not a critique. It's just a legitimate question. What made you decide to do like to pasteurize it instead of putting in something like potassium sorbate or cadmium or something to kill the yeast? Because I'd only done it in bottles before, and this was the perfect opportunity for me to do it. Gotcha. And if I screwed it up, I, I didn't love the taste of it, so I wouldn't be so gotcha, hurt. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's very valid. Yeah. So, like, I brought that brew with us. I was super excited about just, like, having it, but it, you know, to self, and we all tried it and did it, but it wasn't, like, the best thing I've ever done. Mm. Uh, there, there were a couple other ones that I brought to self that were very much popular. better. Yeah. yeah. That banana one was very popular. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that one was much better. Um, but, yeah, so um, – it, it just was a, a thing there. Uh, but pasteurizing is a very valid process for oh, yeah. being able to do Absolutely. a lot of really cool things with your brews. And I had not done it. So I think I might get a, like a pasteurization setup, like mm -hmm. using a cooler and be able to set some bottles down inside of it with hot water mm -hmm. and um, using some, some of the techniques that I know how to do, you know, siphon that water in so it's not like a shock to the stuff and everything else like that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done it, obviously, uh, but I also haven't heard anyone talking about it from this direction. You'd think, get yourself like a small little sous vide set up or something. And that'd be perfect for it. It's that's exactly what the I'm talking about doing. Yeah. yeah, but so you need something that's got either insulated walls or like is a certain like kind of thing, and then you put a bottle that's at the same room temperature and with liquid in the center, so that you know when the temperature of the liquid in the bottles that are capped mm -hmm. get to that that like kind of point yeah. where they're they're pasteurized. So like I've seen how to do it. I want to do it with a uh, like a two gallon um, igloo cooler or something yeah, like yeah. that, or Absolutely. do it in a cooler. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I want to use a sous vide to do it to keep it at the constant temperature. Yeah, that seems like that would work perfect. Yeah, I think it would. And everybody that I've seen that does it does it really great. And you can get a sous vide for like a hundred, hundred and fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. So and it's multi purpose, right? You're like you're not buying something special just for brewing. You can use that in just your regular cooking repertoire. Yeah, exactly. Make steaks, all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. like that. That I really want to get into sous vide cooking and doing some stuff like that. So I think this would be like a fun way to do it. And you could I mean, I wouldn't have to do it in an igloo cooler, so I may not do it. And I'm not thinking of one of the rounds, round ones. I'm thinking yeah, yeah. of like a long mm -hmm. one that I could put the sous vide down inside and then, you know, just shut the top and let them do their thing until it gets to the point that I'm like happy and then, yeah. you know, everything's good. And if it, one of them explodes, don't have to worry about it. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, you know, that'd be a fun experiment for us to do. The next time I'm going to, like, pasteurize something, like, once mm -hmm. I've got it, like, maybe I'll sweeten something with honey or sugar and want to carbonate it. So we'll bottle it a little early, get natural petalants in it, mm -hmm. and then, you know, do the thing. And maybe I'll keep them in that container in case one of them explodes. Like, do a small one or two gallon yeah. batch like that. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point with the carbonation, right? Because a, a warm liquid cannot hold as much carbonation as cold liquid. So, like, when you pasteurize it, how much of that carbonation are you going to lose just from it heating up if you're not going to, like, keep it completely sealed? So that would be, like... Well, you would keep them sealed. That's how you keep the carbonation from losing. Yeah. So you like, bottle and seal, and mm -hmm. then... And and this is the thing that I've seen people do. So I've never done this before. Okay. But basically, you bottle and seal. You let them go for whatever your carbonation period is, if you're naturally mm -hmm. carbonating, two, three weeks... And then once you're sure that they're carbonated or you feel like it's at that point, you put them in the thing and then you run your pasteurization process and that kills your yeast. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I just earlier when you were talking about, you said you were like left the lid slightly ajar, but you're saying for carbonated, you would keep them sealed. You would keep them sealed. Yeah. And I did that in the, um, the brew vessel, the brew vessel, yeah. because the brew vessel is not designed to contain that sort of thing. I didn't want it to crack. Mm -hmm. So yep, I kept I the you. lid ajar just in case it started boiling or something, which I didn't want it to. But it wasn't that bad. And, I mean, like, for the most part, I could just take a minute out. 
Yeah, and like with UV, you never have to worry about boiling over because, again, you exactly. control it. You set it to 180 or whatever yep. the, the temperature you want. It'll never boil. It'll never do any of that. Do it yeah. for like an hour, and then you're good. Mm-hmm. You know. So let's talk about Tosna 3.0. All right. So we've Tell talked about in. Tosna methods before. and you, Tosna 2, 2.5, 2.3.0, 2.0, they're kind of similar. There's just slightly different ratios and a couple of other mm-hmm. – like so someone that's really into the Tosna stuff will tell me no it's completely different and this one is used for this and this one but from a outsider looking in I'm not mm-hmm. I'm just kind of learning about this right now um, it's a, a fermentation nutrient scheduling methodology and there's a couple of different ones but I use this for the candy corn mead Mm-hmm. I used it for the blueberry uh, hibiscus uh, mead that I made, the melomel, and I used it for the buckwheat boche. And all of them came out clear. All of them came out drinkable within a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is less than a year old. Yep. Um, and both of these are. And they came out very um, quick fermentations. You know, for the most part, mm-hmm. there's not like some sort of crazy. Yeah, they're very efficient. Yeah. Um, so, and and I feel like the yeast didn't get super stressed. Like happens in some of our other brews, some of our new, our, our younger brews. It took like four or five months for that stress mm-hmm. off flavor to get out of there. So this is just more of me saying, if you haven't tried a Tosna calculator, because I mean, basically you just put in what your batch is and then it tells you. How many grams or ounces to use of Fermaid O, Fermaid K, um, when you can put DAP in, stuff like that. Because you're, you're supposed to, this isn't something that I knew. I was just using DAP as my um, my um, uh, nutrient base mm-hmm. the, the whole time. And so when I did other Tosna calculations, I think I was using 2.0. When I was using that, um, I would use DAP the whole time. But you're not supposed to use DAP. Okay. You're supposed to use DAP only at the beginning if you're going to use it. And then you use something like Fermate K or Fermate O towards the end because the diammonium phosphate, the uric acid, mm-hmm. is bad for yeast as they get, yeah. get, get further in. So I didn't know all that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know all that at first, the gotcha. things you learned. So it sounds like they're probably good for nutrients but bad for reproduction. So you put it in the beginning to kind of help wake everything up, but you don't want it at the end when they're all multiplying. Yeah, the it's something about the release of oxygen and nitrogen balance mm-hmm. that uh, is really good at the beginning, and I don't understand it fully. I didn't do all the research. I just know that people say, you're not supposed to use DAP at the end. And, it, and the little bit of research I did um, in reading on it, you know, led me to understand that it has to do with the NOx with the oxygen nitrogen balance that is created at the beginning i could be wrong about gotcha. that don't quote me on that but um basically after it gets to a certain point you don't want those things to happen so you want to use more of a like yeast hull you know gotcha. more other okay. nutrient kind of thing like stuff that you get from plant matter and stuff like mm-hmm. that you know so that's that's what uh that kind of looks like with the tosna scheduling now we didn't use a Tosna scheduling on the fig wine that we made. Mm-hmm. So we made so just so we haven't talked about this yet. In the break, Ricky and I got together. He had figs. Ricky had wonderful fig children that we sacrificed to the wine gods. Yeah, and have, we had too many. <laughs> Three of the trees in my yard turn out to be fig trees, <laughs> and there were hundreds. So many. And you froze some because I was like, oh, I know about fig wine, and fig wine is great. So we just decided we were going to do it. Uh, and we started off with using, like, uh, uh, fig butter. Yeah, we used the products of me trying to keep up with three fig trees. Yep. Butter and jam that were, I mean, that's still decent. It was like 20 ounces. Yep. You know, it was a lot. And we still had, like, three or four pounds of frozen. Yeah. So we used frozen in secondary. Mm-hmm. Um, well, no, it's still technically in primary because we didn't, We it, even though we racked it to the other thing, we did a... Uh, a rough rack where we re-swirled mm-hmm. the, the yeast. So we racked it to a, another vessel, but we put the fig and um, everything else in it, and we added more honey to make it sweeter. So it's like a 13%, 14% you know, ABV 
thing. I think right now it's like at 12 because mm-hmm. it's um, eight through like one point one or uh, 10 points of gravity. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, a, a, a pretty a, a well done uh, fig mead here, but we didn't use the Tosna methodology for it. So I intentionally didn't do that because it had so much nutrients in it. I want to see if we needed to use Tosna yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see that because really, you know, we we're using pomegranate juice to help bring some darkness to it, and then just a bunch of plant matter. Yeah, I mean it's it's not that dissimilar of like if you were going to make a cider, you use some apple juice, but then just throw like. 20 30 apples in there yeah so you're right and like in theory it should have nutrients for days so like how does that really affect it if you're not already in a high nutrient environment exactly so um we're gonna see how that ends up at at, at the end so far uh it did ferment a little bit more it's probably at the yeast tolerance we think so we we tested that this morning tastes really good a little yeah. young but it's mm-hmm. pretty fantastic i'm looking forward to seeing how that yeah that'll up. age really well yeah once we uh once we rack it over i think we should oak it i think that'll be like the next thing to do and uh we could like do a little bit of an experiment since we have two gallons we could divide it up between two one gallon jars yeah, and that's true like do some different things to each side of it so we know exactly what recipe we want next year mm-hmm. when you get more turkey figs yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't eat, try and eat a hundred of them in two days to keep up. Ah, man, but figs are so good. I also was thinking about this. Uh, since we're doing a brewing episode, we have a couple of minutes. Cantaloupe wine. Mm-hmm. All right. So I, I know that people make cantaloupe beers, like melon beers. Yep. So I, I was eating a cantaloupe the other day, and I was just kind of thinking about, like, what is this kind of – could we make a like cider wine kind of thing out of cantaloupe or maybe like honeydew and cantaloupe mm-hmm. together? That would be really good, I think. Like something that's kind of like a crisp session mead yep. kind I of thing. I could definitely see something like that. Or a session wine kind of thing, you know, lower ABV, but mm-hmm. like really intense cantaloupe Yeah, I was flavor. thinking that same thing. You know, it, once you start trying to hit those high ABVs, you're going to be extracting so much sugar, it's probably going to be hard to get that melon across. Yeah. But Although, aim for like a 5 or 6%. I mean, I'm using this as an example of this has blueberry flavor, has hibiscus flavor. It's definitely got the spices and the vanilla in there yeah, that I was that, going for. that's also kind of my point. It doesn't taste like you're biting into blueberries and hibiscus. It's got those, like, essences. Yes. And the essences are nice, but it needs those other spices. Like, if that yeah. was just the blueberry, that wouldn't taste that great. Because it's all those other things coming to the plate that make everything stand out. Whereas if you want, like, a really melon-forward something... It's probably like a ton of melon, only let it get to like five, six percent, and then leave a lot more of those natural sugars in, which there already aren't a lot in melon. Yeah. But I think you can get that. I, I don't know how to describe it other than that sliminess, <laughs> like that kind of like wetness that comes with the melon that's yeah. that sweetness. Because I think that's where the real flavor is. Like I feel if you took like cantaloupe flavor and put it in like something that wasn't kind of like that, that moistness. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't taste as good, you know? Yeah, I I mean, I don't know that I agree with that, but I can see where you're coming from there. I think, I think what I would probably be looking more for is the slight cantaloupe flavor that you kind of get um, if you were to, like, do, like, a cantaloupe puree or something like that. that so okay. an example that, that I'm thinking about is, like, um, su- uh, summer squash. Mm-hmm. If you take that and you make a, a like, a a stew with it or something like that. Um, it's such a wonderful stew, but the flavor, it like gives it a thickness. It's kind of like healthier for you, like all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But then when you, when you take the stew in the flavor of it is, it's like this very sweet flavor. And then you get this like hint at the back end of the squash. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and so that's kind of what I have in my mind Okay, for this, like, wine thing that we're talking about making. Then, yeah, here. then I think you're right. If if you're thinking about it in that realm, then kind of how we did the blueberry yeah. probably makes the most sense because you really you just want that essence of melon to it Yeah, and not to necessarily be, like, really melon forward. But I think we could probably do two. If we got, like, I mean, we could probably get, like, two things of cantaloupe. You know, put one cantaloupe, like puree one cantaloupe, 
put some pectic enzyme on it, do some other things, maybe roast the other cantaloupe, mm-hmm. and then take the cantaloupe and maybe take the peel and put it into a tincture so you get some of the like that like green part that's in the back so you get some of that because that's got a little bit of bitterness and yeah. everything like that. And then at the end, put that in like secondary. Mm-hmm. And see how that takes in one, and then see how the other, yeah. one, the puree does in the other. Yeah, the touch on the secondary is a good point. I was thinking, what would happen if you made like just a good base alcohol with mm-hmm. your spices and your other things, and then you put the cantaloupe in it, let that sit for a couple days, puree it out, then filter it. Yeah. So the idea that you're kind of like, almost doing the same thing you do with like a tincture you're just using that alcohol as a solvent to extract all that flavor really cutting it up fine so it all diffuses but then taking all that pulp out yeah yeah i uh, kind of thinking the same way Mm -hmm. with the with the uh, puree i was thinking you take a puree you make the puree and then you put that into a bag like a like a nut milk bag and then you set that down in like a thing of vodka or something Mm -hmm. let that extract all of that cantaloupe flavor or you could even just put it in your brew and see if like the uh, the alcohol in the brew will extract the flavor yeah exactly yeah so that you know something like that and then that kind of becomes your tincture that versus making a like roasted cantaloupe like kind of thing and and then having like a tincture of your spices and your tannins from the like peel or mm. not, it's, it's not the peel, it's that green part. The part that's almost, like, into the pith. Yeah, that's Or the cantaloupe. Saying. Yeah. Like, you take that and whatever spices you're yeah. going to use, which probably be, like, cardamom, maybe pepper, maybe you might even put a little bit of salt into it, mm. you know, to, to get that kind of, like, Yeah, and that, would, that should out. work fine, because, you know, that, that piece of the rind is very, like, cucumber-esque. Exactly. You know? So, like, that's got its own flavors. That's, I mean, it's great for stuff for cooking. I actually have yeah. um, someone made, like watermelon rind pickles that were really good mm. you know so I, I can definitely see it well i think that's everything though for today Th- this was an extra long episode 36 yeah, minutes we're rambling <laughs> we're rambling about the brews now Sneak yeah this peak br- into next season brew episode major spoilers don't listen to this one if you're wanting to, to keep what's happening next season under wraps everyone loved the late spoiler warnings <laughs> That's, uh, that's what I do. I, I spoil things, and then I'm like, spoilers. Um, yeah, so this has been Season 5, Episode 12 of the Beer and Broadband Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time.